Today I'm going to talk about a generative model for medical images and more specifically volumetric medical images, state of the art and where we are and where we are going to. So this joint collaboration with uh, two of my students who just graduated, uh, Yan Wuzu and Lee San, and um, a couple of colleagues from CMU from Human Computer Interaction. Hopefully during the talk, you'll see what's the connection with Human Computer Interaction and my collaboratory in uh, University of Pittsburgh, Shyam Viswaswaran. So as most of you know, the field of generative AI has gone a very long path so far. This is where we were back in 2014, that the best we can do was these blurry pictures. Within a span of five years, uh, the field managed to create like, quite realistic looking images. In 2022, we are able to even condition and control our generation with the text quite realistically. Where the field is currently right now is that you can create any style of the images with a very sharp detail. Now we have this recent development in OpenAI that you can create even high resolution videos with a text prompt. This progress has also arrived in the field of uh, medical imaging. Uh, this is just a snapshot from 2021 all the way to 2023. Uh, specifically even for diffusion model, which is one of the subcategories of the generative model. And the color represent different application of the generative model in the field of medical imaging, ranging from image segmentation, classification, explanation, helping explanation denoising. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here during the talk. Hopefully it can make you uh, um, convinced that like, there are application into this field. So for example, what we want to do, we want, we want to achieve eventually, is to provide a prompt in the form of a text similar to uh, explanation of the image in the, in the radiology report, what is in the radiology report, that can create realistic look images. For example, in this prompt, um, a, a user may ask, like, you, I want to see a, create a volumetric image. Volumetric image is a 3D image. You can think of it as a, as a video of a slices that includes plural effusion, a condition in the lung, et cetera, like, um, et cetera. So, so it's the, the text that is provided in the form of radiology report is a detailed explanation of what we can see in the image. And at the end, you want to create realistic looking synthesis images. That's what we achieve in uh, the, this paper that looks like, that reflects the condition and is consistent with the explanation of, uh, of the radiologist. Then you can use this synthetic data set for any of the downstream tasks. So why is it useful? For example, like one of the, the, um, the, the issues in, 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 in area of uh, AI for healthcare is availability of, the, uh, availability of the data. Hospitals are reluctant to release the data for many reasons, ranging from privacy to um, other concerns. But perhaps one of the, uh, the you know, replacement would be creating synthetic data and releasing synthetic data instead of real data set. And then this synthetic data set can be used for any of the downstream tasks, for example. So creating a model for segmentation, they can sell it uh, to, for example, for companies that they are trying to make a solution, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not just an, this um, application for training a model, it can be also used for auditing a pre-trained model. So here is an example, let's say that um, the company came and said that I, I created um, the black box AI model to detect the plural effusion. And I want to, uh, and the, the clinician is interested to see what are the things, what are the, the, the features that in an image that the model is focusing on. In our experience with the radiologists, they really don't like this heat map um, that uh, is very common in computer vision because they are not able to answer why question. Like, uh, for example, they cannot answer what you change in an image that change the decision of the black box. So one of the, 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 the general approach in the field is so-called counterfactual explanation. Like, for example, to give you an example of what is counterfactual explanation, let's say that you have x-ray images of a patient, you put it into some deep learning black box and it creates some probability of a disease. And then the idea here, this is a factual outcome. And then you want to create some sort of a knob for the user so that it can move the knob toward the other side that changes the probability and create the synthetic images that reflects that probability. This is not, this is the counterfactual outcome. So give you an example, for example, let's say that you have a, you, you have a black box that you take a cat and dog from each other. The input is the query image and then playing with this knob is 
equivalent of traversing the, uh, the, the feature space from one end to another spectrum. You can imagine the same thing for medical images. For example, in this case, it's pleural fusion. So if the black box is focusing important features by traversing from one end of the spectrum, you do expect the boundary of the lung to go from the sharp to the, the curve shape because, the, because of the accumulation of the fluid on the boundary of the lung. You can also use it for studying the progression of the disease. So for, for example, in this case, you want to see how the tumor will progress over time or will reflect or like interpolate the progression of the disease a couple of months down the road. Another application is so-called imputation of the modality. Let's say that you, the, the, the patient comes to, this, uh, to the scanner and you have MR, but then you are suspicious that something going on perhaps in the bone, the bone does not have, the, have enough contrast for visual understanding in MR, and you want to synthesize the uh, CT images has, which has a better contrast on the, on the heart tissues, for example, in the bone. But you don't want to send the scanner, uh, send the patient to the scanner again. So you can synthesize the other scanner from the uh, for MR scanners. Another application is image reconstruction. Um, as some of, uh, as you may know, the way that MR uh, CT work is that a, 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 a big tube that emit X-ray rotate around the patient and emit X-ray on multiple angles. And one of the um, uh, interesting applications is to reduce the amount of the X-ray by reducing the number of angles you, you uh, emit X-ray. So a generative model can be used as an effective prior that can help to reduce the number of uh, uh, angles that you perform acquisition. And there are many other applications. This is just uh, you know, the small examples of why we need this generative model. But I want to show you an example all the way from model explanation that you can use it to audit the black boxes, to explanation model, to augmentation, to release the, uh, the synthetic data instead of real data, et cetera, et cetera. So this talk, I'm not going to go too much detail into how this generative model work, but Overall, the overall idea of a generative model is that you have some exogenous noise that is coming from some canonical distribution that comes, that will be one input to this uh, kind of like a black box model, this neural network, with some condition, uh, with some conditions. So what are the examples of this condition? For example, the prompt that I uh, mentioned earlier is an example of the condition. This is, of course, optional, depends on your application, and depends on like, uh, what you want to do with the condition. And at the end, you want to synthesize an image out of it. Given exogenous and condition, you want to create an image. You have a lot of um, um, flexibility, what to uh, enter as a condition. Here's the text is in a condition, but also another image can be a condition. For example, in the uh, example that I gave you earlier, that you want to impute uh, another modality, image can be a condition. So if you think about the landscape of the deep generative model, the many, 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 many methods has been um, proposed over the course of years. Today, we're going to talk about the diffusion model that is like lies somewhere in this landscape of the generative model. So I won't go through the detail of like how um, the generative model, I'll give you like a general idea. I'm going to put a lot of details under the rug. I'm happy to discuss after that. But general idea of generative model is like this. You start with some data set. So here is like an image of a cat, here represented by x0, and you incrementally add noise to it. So what do I mean by that? So that if I want to write exact how it's worked, that in this incremental procedure, the, the, the previous step is scaled, and some amount of noise, the Gaussian noise, is added to this incrementally in multiple steps until at some point the image is indistinguishable from random draw from noise distribution. This is called forward process in diffusion. There is no parameter to learn here. The beta is just a scheduling, um, it's a predefined scheduling procedure. What is learnable is the reverse procedure. In a reverse procedure, you are given image of the previous step, and you want to denoise it. So, uh, so the general idea here is that you are given the image of the previous noisy step, and you want to denoise it to the, to the less noisy result. Of course, I'm putting a lot of details under the, uh, under the rug, but the general idea here is that you have a neural network that inputs the XT, more noisier version, and try to denoise it by one step. 
And usually, the, uh, it, it's viewed as a simple regression problem. So you get the, uh, you pass it through some uh, mu theta, is it some neural network that is parameterized by theta, get the noisy image, and try to do pixel-wise prediction of less noisy result. And you have the entire procedure because you were the one that added the noise. Uh, so uh, this is basically the, uh, the driving force of the denoising procedure, um, uh, the denoising process of the diffusion model. So why is it important? So if you manage to create such a denoiser, you can start from the like, complete noise and then you repeat this process several times until you arrive at uh, like a complete denoise result. So you can effectively view a generative model as concatenation of the several steps of this denoising procedure. So what is inside of this neural network? There are multiple choices. Perhaps one of the most common one is an architecture called UNET, which has a bunch of convolution forward and a bunch of like deconvolution that increase the resolution plus some skip connection. There are multiple choices, but this is just for sake of this talk. <coughs> UNET is sufficient. So, so it seems that like at least the, the, the general architecture is quite straightforward what would happen if you want to apply this for medical images? So give you an, an example of like how the medical images look like. We are more specifically focusing on the long tissue. The images that you see on the top are different cuts of the CT long images. So this image, um, see, I, I guess you see my mouse. All right. So this is a cut like this. The other one is cut, so this is called axial cut. The other image is called sagittal cut, and, um, and the other one's called um, so coronal cut, and the other one's sagittal cut. So the entire CT image is, is a sequence of, this, of, of, of the cuts usually acquired in an axial uh, case, at least for uh, CT images, and you can view this as a concatenation of, um, of 2D images. All right, so the idea here is that you are able to, uh, to draw some noise from some canonical distribution, for example, this cause, and it synthesized images that look like this. And the example of the prompt are the text prompt that are very similar to radiology reports. So, but this is quite a challenging task. So let me give you an idea. So the images that you see on, 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 on right, is image of, uh, from perhaps like 2002, that was the initial version of the um, um, video generation. This is what the field was in, in, in the late 2022, that even back then we were able to create like 2D um, signals. If you look at the medical images, if, it, if you look at the look at, at the high level to have an idea about the level of complexity, the number of pixels on the, on the CT images is actually higher than what we were able to do in um, uh, at least back in 2022, uh, like late 22, early 23, with the video generation. So from computational point of view, it's quite challenging task. So one may say that, like, why is it a challenging task? You can do this on a 2D images. Why not generating images on 2D and, 2D and concatenate them with each other? So let's do that. So this is, of course, I'm, uh, I'm exaggerating visually to show the result. If you create the, the 2D images and then put them on the top of each other, and then you create the cut on the other uh, axis, like, for example, you create the images in axial cut and then put them next to each other, you're going to arrive on things like this. That anatomically is quite un inconsistent. If you look at it on the axial domain, it looks great. But if you put them next to each other, it's no anatomically feasible. It looks like the, the vertebrate of the person is disjoint everywhere. There are also a lot of anatomical detail that needs to be accounted for. So here is some previous example of the, of the method that are published uh, earlier. And I'm going to show you an example of that and compare it against the real result. When you look at the images like this, um, it may look very similar. I don't see that much of detail. But if you really want to use it for real world anatomical application and you zoom in, there are some very important part that is missing. I don't know if any of the, uh, the, the folks in the audience can detect 
any, is there any radiologist in the audience? Okay, all right. If there was any radiologist in the audience, they would have pointed out that, oh, that line is missing. That line is supposed to separate different lobes of the lung from each other. If it is missing, the radiologist may say, like, well, this person has a congenital disease. That means he was not born with this, uh, with this lobe, which is important, or has pneumonia. So this lobe is supposed to separate different sections of the lung, like usually in, in, in any normal person, you have two lobes on one side and three lobes on the other side. And this thin line is a thin tissue called fissure line that separates these two lobes from each other. Why is it important? Remember how this kind of diffusion works. We create a denoiser that creates a pixel-wise regression. So contribution of that single line that contains so much information is very little into pixel-wise regression. So presence or absence of that small line does not change this loss function that much. But it's very important from clinical uh, application down the road. Another application is, another important details are a structure of the tissue, in this case, lung. So here I'm showing you an example of the airways tree and artery and veins. Artery and veins these are basically the vessels that brings this, uh, the, the blood with the CO2 rich to the lung and then take uh, the C, uh, oxygen rich back to the body. This is structure, although like even in this resolution, you won't see that much of detail, although if you look at my monitor, perhaps this would be more, much more detailed. It's quite important because for some of the diseases, for example, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, these structures start pruning means that small uh, vessel structures start disappearing, and that means that that tissue start dying. So if these details are missing, it may result in completely different conclusion for the radiologist. They may say they may think differently about the severity of the disease. So there are computational challenges, and there are domain-specific challenges. Let me summarize the challenges. So from a um, computational point of view, we are talking about the academic setting. Um, so we should be able to create a model that is, that is we are able to train it in a you know, GPU poor academic setting that we are, most of us live in. So there are anatomical detail and consistencies that are important for decision making. And we want to still create a high resolution CT images. And we, are, we want to be able to be able to control the detail with the text prompt. Unfortunately, all of the methods that we have at this point that create uh, 2D images with the text prompt are focused on 2D. And for 3D, best of, the, the best I know, there's no method exists. Also, evaluation is a challenge. So it seems that there are small details that, that can be missing in an image that change the decision of the, of the, of the user. So in the following slide, we are, I'm going to tell you how we achieve this, at least partially, and what are the, the next step and what are the, where the field is going. I think if you want to build such a model, the care has to be, we have to pay attention to all of the details in starting from pre-processing step. So one of the important things is that how you pre-process the data. So one of the important pre-processes is to register images to anatomical atlas. And that can reduce the variance of, uh, of the data substantially. So give you an idea of why it can re result in reduction of the variance. If you align all of the images with some anatomical atlas, roughly you know on which slide what kind of organ you should expect. Because all of them are aligned with roughly with some anatomical atlas. As a result, the model roughly know on this each, uh, slice location what to generate. And this is the result of just pre-processing. Also, in order to reduce the hallucination of the model, we can create some sort of like a multi-resolution approach that not only generate images, but also generate um, anatomical landmark as some sort of skeleton that regulate the reconstruction of the model. So in the following slides, I'm going to tell you a little bit detail about like, how this model is constructed without going too much to the detail. But at a high level, this is basically a model that consists of two steps that first create uh, the text prompt controlled image generation at low resolution and then increase the resolution by, uh, by several magnitude. 
in a way that is the, the data can be managed in the memory in what kind of the, the GPUs that we have access to without losing detail. To give you an example of how radiology reports look like, this is an example of the, how the radiology reports looks like. Usually radiology, radiology reports look like two sections, finding and in, in impression. That finding usually have details explanation of what they see, and impression is kind of summarization, or we can think of a conclusion of the radiologist. So we create a, we use the language model that is fine-tuned around like 200,000 uh, radiology report so that the, the language model that uses the finding and report section of the radiology report is adapted to the, to the, to the type of um, details that you see in the radiology report. So overall, the model is consists of two steps, like low resolution generation to make sure that the anatomical consistencies, that uh, the, the problem that I mentioned earlier is, is uh, uh, accommodated to. We use, we basically inject our um, text from during the low resolution. And in order to take care of the huge memory consumption of this model, we put all of these anatomical landmarks as an anchor, as an extra uh, channel. This is a trick that we use to reduce the memory footprint of the model because at the end of the day, most of us have access to the GPUs of like 48 gigabytes and not really much more. And if you don't do that, Unfortunately, because we are thinking about the like volumetric image generation, the amount of usage is cubic with respect to the size of the image. And the next step is a smaller number of the diffusion, means that a smaller number of applying this uh, denoiser that is conditioned this time on a low resolution image and create a high resolution image. And this time, because the low resolution image is used as an anchor, you can, instead of focusing on an entire image, you can focus on a smaller field of view and stitch them together, and you don't lose anatomical consistencies. So I won't go through the detail of the, of the method, but to, let's think about, like, let's look at the couple of results, but just to tum summarize the, the training step, we trained this model in 200,000 radiology report, 9,000 the pair image report, and it's trained only on four uh, A6000 with 48 gigabytes of GPUs for 40,000 iteration, which is something that can be done in academia. So let's, let me show you an example. This is an example of the report. This is an example of the images that uh, I showed you earlier. So here is an example of, the, of the, the real data. This fissure line that I said is important this is an example of the important details, which is you can see that in the real data set. And you can also see that in our, in our generated data, while like previous state of the art using generative adversarial network or diffusion, we'd not be able to preserve it. Here is an example of the conditional generation. This is an example of the report that the user wants to use like large plural fusion in the lung to, to you know, condition your uh, visual um, perception. I'm just showing an example of real data. With this prompt, how does the real data would look like? And this is an example of the synthetic data set that uh, visually looks very similar. You can also negate uh, the, the prompt, the re report, uh, re basically remove that uh, conditions, and synthesize images, and the resulting images basically clear the lock. So here is an example that like, we remove this condition of the, the air is clear, and there is no pleural fusion. You see that the lung is quite clear. So, in another case, um, this is, let me show you another example. This is ex uh, extensive consolidation, another condition in the lung. So here is an example of the real data set with the extensive consolidation. And this is, again, an example of the extensive consolidation. This is the synthetic generated data. This uh, patient does not exist. And again, if you negate the text, you can have a full control, basically, over the condition that you want to see on the images with a lot of details on the specific location of the lung. And this is something that we want to achieve. You can also control for every individual patient. Let's say that for every individual patient, you want to say that like for this specific patient, I want to see how the lung would have looked like if, the, for example, the nodule start disappearing. So he, this time, you can condition on the general lobe structure. So here's the lobe, general lobe, two examples of, of the images that have the same lobular structure that supposed to represent the same individual, but different uh, texture. So one question is that, OK, so we are able to generate uh, synthetic images. We can have a, a very good control over what we can see in the images. 
is there anything, can we go beyond what is in the, in the, in the training data set? So we did extra experiments. Um, so this data set was collected pre-COVID, so there is no COVID case in this case. But because, because we have a full control over the entire uh, data set, we said, okay, what would happen if we bring some of the COVID case, mall haven't seen any COVID case, and then add extra channel at the, at the, at the, to the model, and with only a small number of the, the COVID case, we can fine tune the model. So this is an example, this image that we see on the, on the bottom is the lesion of, that is caused by the COVID. So to give you an example, how does it look like uh, visually in this patient, this is how the COVID lesion looks like an individual. So the model has already have a really good understanding of the, how, how the visual pattern look like, and we just fine tune this model, similar to the instruction fine tuning that we saw a couple of days ago. But this time with very small number of samples. This time the model not only generates images, anatomical landmarks, but also can create a uh, uh, COVID lesion. So you can use this completely as a you know, synthetic data and train some image segmenters. And it turned out that even with a small number of a fine tuning uh, of the model for COVID lesion, you can create a, a image segmenter that improves the state of the art by a large margin. And the reason that is in, it, uh, we are able to achieve that is that the model have learned like general diction, kind of like a, you can think of it as a dictionary of type, the, type of the pattern that you see in the images that can, can adapt to the new data very quickly. We did a ex very extensive evaluation for data augmentation, for like realistic, how images are realistic looking in terms of like, you know, the distribution of the data is look like the real data set, and you can find the detail in this. But so far, I give you all of those metrics that are quantitative metric. What would happen if you show this to the radiologist? So how does the radiologist decide like, if the images are realistic or not? So this is why we team up with a couple of colleagues, with uh, colleagues from CMU in a computer, uh, human computer interaction. And the reason that we need expert in human computer interaction is that designing a survey that works with human is an expertise of its, of its own. And it depends how you condition the human, how to ask a question and how to generate the result and show the result, the outcome might be different. So they are already expert in this field, and what they did is that they, 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 they recruited a radio, uh, several radiologists, they asked questions about their expertise, and created an interface that radiologists can interact with images without knowing uh, how they, where the images are coming from. But they can slice the images on different axes, axial, sagittal, they can change the contrast, they can uh, play with the images, and they start asking questions. So let me show you an example of the question that they ask. Here is some example of the question they asked. They created, they, they show the synthetic images. Radiologists don't know this is synthetic images. And they show that multiple question marks, this is the, which of these like, uh, type of condition is, is, uh, would be a good summarization of the diagnosis for this patient. And it turned out that at least for lung that looked like normal, the lung that are cardiomegaly, which is enlargement of the heart, effusion, Nine out of 10 agreed with the, 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 the prompt. Remember, the prompt was not showed to them. It's only a summary of the prompt uh, that is showed as a multiple question mark. And this is quite close. Like, for example, if you compare the real data set, 10 out of 10 radiologists agreed with the, the final diagnosis. But then uh, the problems, like, they started asking like, more uh, complicated, tougher questions. So, for example, they asked, they created like, Images that is generated by multiple generative model compare it with the real data set. And they start asking questions about the specific things in anatomy. For example, they say that, like, how much do you see the fissure line, that line that I show you that separate the lobe structure from each other? So you should rank the, the approach based on how realistic the fissure line look like. And we did the same thing for lobe structure, vessel structure, which are the important details in the anatomical, in anatomy. And this is the final result. The, the brown, this is basically, the axis shows that number of the average number of times that a method uh, is ranking as a number one. And as expected, the real images, the real uh, images always ranked one. So there, are, there seems to be still, and so the blue is the new method and the other, uh, um, uh, the gray are the other uh, previous stuff. So although it shows that like the, the proposed method 
because it cares a lot about the, how to generate these images and the details should be preserved still, although much better than the previous method, there is a still a significant gap between the real images in detecting the lobular structure. There are also more details in the paper, like it also varies quite a bit with respect to the number of the years that the radiologists have experienced. And this is somewhat consistent for airway structure and vessel structure. So why am I showing you this? It seems that although you can, you can still preserve the detail, there is still some gap that is not easy to explain by, um, by the method, and we still need to have uh, better generators. They also did some interviews with radiologists, um, and for example, they asked them, like, why did you make this diagnosis? So the radiologists sometimes start that because this patient is old, and then they continue that this is, and they said, old? Like, we didn't say anything about age of this patient. Why did you think, why do you think that this patient is old? And they pointed out this area, which is, which is the structure of the vertebrate. And said, so like, this pa patient vertebrate structure seems to be deformed. We didn't control that. And it seems that vertebrate structures, because it's not controlled, it gives a perception of age of the patient. Effectively, there are details in the images that may bias the radiologist toward unwanted consequences. So to summarize, what I believe is that we need to have an anatomically specific foundational model, at least in radiology. There are so much details that are hard to preserve just by creating a loss function. And um, I think there are still like, a lot of space for improvement in that space. If we are able to achieve it, we are able to use this model for data augmentation, for controlling synthesis, for reconstruction. And there are, like, there are a lot of values that come uh, as, as, a, as a good generative approach. Um, you can reduce the amount of em uh, emission of the X-ray during the acquisition. You can create a uh, large amount of data set uh, that can result in a lot of innovation, but there, we still need a better uh, evaluation metric beyond the classical eval evaluation metric that we are using uh, right now. And one of the important components of the evaluation metric is the human evaluation. We are working a new version of this model that is, we are extending to 70,000 CT images. And what I believe is that, like, because industry is not really uh, interested in this kind of approach, we have academic have to collaborate with each other and we are open to uh, collaboration. Thank you very much.